Okay, this is the Model N Ebenrood. Uh, they made it from, when did they make it from? 1923. Wow, okay. Um, is when they started, and um, it evolved into the NF, which is a folding motor in 1929. But the folding motor didn't reverse. Uh, I, I guess so. it probably doesn't. I don't but, think it does. But then this thing reappeared during the Depression. Ah. With, I think Evernude sold a bunch of uh, leftover parts like they did with a lot of these things. Um, so, so this engine did reappear in the early 30s for, as an upward, as you see it, basically, for sale. Okay. Well, my experience with it is I've watched... Uh, several really accomplished members of the club who are very good mechanically and get stuff running really excellently well have a lot of difficulty with this engine. And the president of our club, David Kelly, decided to leave one out and bait me. And I was caught. So I said, fine, I'll put this together. I had a lot of help from Bill Andrelitis. But I said, i got to figure out why these things do not seem to be reversing well. So this is how they work. You push in on the lever, it locks, it stays locked, and you lift up to go in reverse. The propeller rotation forces it around in this direction until it locks, it doesn't go any further. That's where it is, now in reverse. That's not where the problems are with this engine because if you notice, it's locked in here. These claws are on top of these big bands and the engine cannot come out of that claw business, that catch. The problem comes when you go from reverse into forward. Most people don't realize that this handle is a three position handle. It's a, and you only want to go just slightly into the catch, so it just rolls underneath the catch. And it keeps the, the lower unit locked into those claws. It's come up quite a ways, but it's still locked in. And it'll swing around here. Okay. To tilt the engine up, you push the handle down all the way, and up it comes. But what a lot of people are doing with these things, when this thing is, in a, is still adjusted correctly, is when they go from reverse into forward, they push all the way down, and it allows this thing to pop out, so it pops out about here and jams. And it won't go any further, and now you've got the whole boat going sideways. So it's very important to not push down all the way, you just clear that little, that little clip. It's a three position handle. Even though it doesn't click into the third position, it's, it's, you have to be mindful of it. So when you're adjusting these things, you wanna make sure that in forward, it's just catching these barrels. These claws are just still sitting on top of the barrel so it can't come out. And when you push down the handle, it just clears them. You want to adjust clearly. So you have to adjust this piece right here. These two screws, you can loosen them up and raise and lower this uh, catch ring. So it's a good running engine. It does reverse quite well. Um, I was surprised. I did not expect it to run anywhere near as well as it does. So the mystery is with these things is why there are not any carburetors. There are lots of pieces and parts for them. Everybody seems to have them, but no carburetors. So, so this model N Evernude is the um, similar vintage, you know, early to mid to late twenties as the Johnson, the most famous Johnson Light Twin. And Johnson achieved this reversing just by reversing. Yeah. So, so, and and we'll show that in the next video. I showed a little bit of it already. But Johnson achieved the same thing with just by spinning the engine around. A lot simpler. And when you look at the complication of this, <laughs> you, you, it, it makes you wonder a little bit, really, as to could this company have even made any money? Well, being a mechanic, I would know exactly what the problem has always been. Engineers. Yeah, Rob. Well, they sure, love I'm complicating sure. yeah. stuff. Of course, they just keep engineering, <laughs> engineering and engineering, engineer to engineer. So, yeah, I, I, can, I can see that. But you'd think that management of the company at some point would say, look, this is, you know, this is going to cost us a lot of money. And, um, but anyway, it was a very successful design and as demonstrated here. And um, it was an example. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. Action roll. Okay.
Um, we're going to continue to talk about um, reverse with outboards, and I think we covered pretty well reversing engines. And that is where an engine can actually rotate backwards. And we covered the early days, and, and actually even this great inboard here. I mean, that was it was very very typical for an engine to um, to be able to run backwards and forwards, especially for these. Well, they, this so, one actually has a transmission. Right, but I know, but right. a lot they of these did launches, a, right. You, know, you could reverse it. That. Yes. So, but now we you know we talked about the some of the early robot motors that would run backwards for the purpose of reverse. After Ole left his original Evernude company, um, and I believe Ole was a simplifier of sorts that would, would look for technical excellence with, with simplicity. The company changed a little bit away from, in 14, with the reversible robot motor um, and a reversible magneto. Um, in 1915, Evernude came out with a very different system, and that is um, a reversing, reversible lower unit that would now, pivot. Now, and, explain something to me, though. My understanding was that 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 uh, Ole was a battery-driven man. Very much so. And right. he did not have a magneto. He didn't believe in magneto. Well, as soon as he left the company, uh, right around, it's, it's, it's not clear, but right around the time when he left the company, um, there was a, a couple electrical engineers or, or engineers of sorts that developed the fl first flywheel magneto for outboard motors. Okay. Now, whether Ole hired them to do that job or they were doing it in some other way, but uh, which did uh, result in a patent for that company to have a flywheel magneto. And, okay. um, but at some point, they um, decided that we we're going to not worry about reversing the engines anymore and we we're going to do a different design. And I think we covered it with the Model N quite well, but this is an early version of the same thing. And this by rotating. Now this is not a, a lifting of the handle, this is a rotating of the handle which unlocks a mechanism up under the power head and it allows the um, lower unit to rotate freely. Um, and the lower unit would rotate around and lock in the reverse position. So now as an operator of the bow you are now moving in reverse. So this is up in this box right up yeah, here. Okay. Box, All right. Yeah. yeah. And you think this one's been disabled? Yeah, I, never, I think I so. Never, yeah. I never... So anyway, then another go. twist to the handle in the other direction, the lower unit would, would unlock and, and relock in the forward position. Okay. And that was, that was um, the Evernude um, first, and it's a 1915 effort that, that, that they did that. And, uh, well, who... Evernude sold his share out to... Chris Meyer. Chris right. Meyer, right. And, and Chris I, Meyer owned the company, and... Then the next guy that owned it was uh, Zinn. There's a few of them. Walter the Zinn. Yeah. And then there was uh, the guy Petrie, who really spent some money and built the new factory, who built. Petrie was the guy that basically saved the company from okay. crazy. Okay. I mean, Evernude had a long history of, um, I think, in the 20s, of um, a lot of engineering activity, but not great money making ideas. And they were struggling to keep keep up with Johnson and Lockwood and Kale at the same time. So, so here we are, 1915. Everyone comes out with a reversible lower unit. So, what else is going on in the industry? Well, Kale, with their single cylinder rowboat motor, came out with a reversible propeller. And this was prior to our entry into World War One, was it this not? This would have been 1915 is 1915? when Kale introduced it. So and, it would have been this very... one is a later version. This is the small twin. But basically the the single cylinder rowboat motor had basically the same lower unit as this. And this uh, it had external uh, mechanisms. Mechanism. Right. And you can see it shift, yeah? yeah. Okay. So so there we have reverse. So we'd go from reverse to the kind to of feathered, a neutral, which would be neutral, and yeah. then full speed forward. forward. They call it a five-speed because there's five little notches on the quadrant. 
yeah. but but how you find all those little positions is not not so easy. I mean, it's a nice it's a nice action, but it's hard to find just the so you know partial speed and forward is there, full speed is there, and neutral is somewhere in here. What would be the reason of having that partial speed to make it go really slow? Probably idle it down and then put it in partial for fishermen, speed. Right? Okay. For fishermen in okay. the in the um, in the teens. So Kale persisted with this design for its whole life of company, um, starting in 1915 and running till 1935 or something. So this this one. So when they came out with a small twin. In 25, I believe, is when they came out with So this is 1925. Okay, yeah. we're, we're talking almost 10 years later. Yeah, right. And they're right. still maintaining yeah, it. Yeah, okay. Kale was very slow to um, also go to a two-cylinder away from the single-cylinder rowboat motor. Um, but Kale, as they, you know, progressed, they still persisted with this variable pitch propeller thing and, and really refined the design to... To this, where 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 when you look at it, you say it almost it almost doesn't look like a variable pitch prop. You see no mechanism, hardly any brake, but yet it's quite the it's quite a nice piece of work. Yeah, this engine runs quite well. Yeah, I mean, no complaints on this yeah. one. Yeah. Was this cheaper to to make than a regular propeller? No, it couldn't of course not. Not even close, so. right? So right. somehow they. They just stayed with this feature through their through their company history. They did offer a non-reversal propeller, and this is an example here of just a regular a kale with this a regular, one right here. Yes, regular propeller. It looks very similar. The lower unit does. Yeah. And it's probably about the, the same, same ears too. Yeah, almost, yeah. yeah, yeah. And they both are right yeah. there. Yeah. So they, huh. you know, by the early '30s, they were in trouble financially, and they had to come up with ways to be competitive price-wise, and. Uh, Certainly, having the variable pitch prop was not uh, competitive. Yeah, it was not really competitive. Right. And people certainly weren't demanding that feature anymore either. Right. So um, while we're still in the in the teens, and we talked about the variable pitch propeller, a couple other outboard motors motor makers uh, did a variable pitch propeller. All right. And Waterman was another one. Um, I believe that would there be their model uh, C15. Okay. In I think 1914 or 1915. Um, was the company owned by Waterman? C16, at that time? maybe. Maybe it was like 1915 or 16. Who owned the company at that point? He sold out to I somebody think the quite Arrow early on. Company or something. Arrow. Yeah. Okay. I, I forgot that some of the history, but uh, so Waterman did have a variable pitch propeller. Oh, as well. okay. And there might have been a couple others too, which I can't recall. So. As the 20s came along, and we, t we talked about the Johnson a little bit already, uh, when we were talking about a non-reversible engine. This is a pretty typical example of a, of a light twin. This is a, a later one, um, but, but these really became available in very late 1921. And uh, they were very extremely The big difference popular. on this one is the water system. Yeah, the water system. But right. But, but Johnson's answer to this reversing problem was just simply this, okay? Just rotating it. Plain and simple. And it was a nice piece of uh, en engineering work. It's, it's simple. Um, they even addressed the problem of, of the, the lower unit kicking up, um, you know, when it was in reverse by having these special... Um, locks. Locks, yeah, yeah. you know, and... and you could uh, see them engaged, right? Yeah, so... So anyway, they they really did well from an engineering point of view on this. And simple. Very simple. No tricky sh starting and shutting off and playing around. Um, it, it's, it's actually very like intuitive. It's a nice design because you just anybody cool. could you know anybody could do it. By the time and I that believe Johnson had a patent on that, and that caused some problems for other people in the industry. And oh, that's really. That could have been the reason why, you know, Kale persisted with the variable pitch prop because they probably didn't want to infringe on that. And uh, I've heard it said by 26, 27, Johnson was outselling all the others combined two that's to right. one. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I, I and, read that someplace. Because it started good, and yeah. they were... Yeah. They're a very they, good product. They're they delivered simple. what they said they were right. going to. Yeah. No battery ignition right. to work. No battery to carry. I think Elto carried on that battery ignition probably way longer than, you know, th th there were already perfected companies with good magnetos, especially this Johnson, the quick action magneto that. Uh, yeah. They're extraordinarily good. Yeah. Even by today's standards, they work very, very well. So I think that that kind of covers us on. Um, on reversing, reversing engines and reversing outboards, at least in the antique era, we should still talk now about the the great breakthrough though of the um, of nineteen forty nine. Yes. Right? Yeah, there was a great breakthrough, and and, and, and that, that Johnson and Scott Atwater, Johnson and Scott Atwater came out with theirs. We have. I'm gonna turn it off. Just action. Okay, so we've covered a lot of I think different. Manufacturers' techniques for reversing, whether it's reversing the engine physically or or mechanically, uh, we've covered um, a lot of different techniques. But the, of course, by far the, the the breakthrough for the outboard industry was an actual shifting, mechanically shifting lower unit that would do forward neutral reverse and that that was like a huge breakthrough 1949 um, and I don't think it was really clear as to who was quite first whether it was Johnson or Scott Atwater they say they're both together they both yeah. came out yeah uh, pretty really much identical so. same year same month same everything but. so anyway this is a nice example of a Scott Atwater with a shifting shifting lower unit it's a shift handle right there yeah. so and Really, it uh, no more fooling with uh, awkward spinning of things, and it, it led. It really opened the door for remote, good remote control. Yes. So now we could hook a cable to that shift lever, or a rod, or something, and have a, a control cable up forward of the boat with steering and throttle, and now shifting. It made for quite the uh, maneuverable boat for anybody to use. Without question. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. that was the answer. Yeah. And everything else yeah. didn't really anywhere near work anywhere as well as that full gear shift. So there. when was the first Mercury gear shift? Merc Mercury, Mer first Mercury gear shift was what, the Cruiser, yeah, which is this one right here. Right. Right. And that was what, 53? Uh, let's see what 52? the sign says. I think it was 52, but I'm okay. not positive. Yeah. Let's just take a look. H7, that would have been 1952, so well, that would have been introduced yeah. in sometime in 52. Right. So that lower unit looks very much like a Mark 20 lower unit. Very similar, yeah. yes, very similar. And the Mark 15, Yeah. they are all really very close to each other. In fact, the Mark 30 even is the same same design lower right. unit. Um, right. Yeah. And they work very well. You know, they had some problems they had to work out, but this one right. did not have uh, a a uh, control box for it originally. Mm. You had to do quite a bit of cowl cutting and so forth. Sure. That you could right. get one. So other manufacturers, even at that time, struggled with, with a gear shift. Uh, example, the Martin um, had full pivot reverse like, like the early Johnsons. Yeah. And then uh, they came out with uh, with the Mark uh, um, Martin seventy five, which had that neutral. I think that was like a neutral clutch. Yes. And the Martin one hundred had a neutral clutch, but they never. The Martin company, I don't think, ever really came out with a full gear shift. There's rumors of some Martin two hundred had some full gear shift. Reverse. Rumors, but I don't think anybody's ever seen one other than yeah, a prototype. Yeah, right, yeah. Or something right. like that. So I can't think of, uh, of course, the 50s are not my expertise. So well, they got, what, what other makers? Uh, well, the other, the other, along with Barton, you had Johnson. These, right. these models right here, the five horsepower, some of them had a uh, neutral little flange up oh, yeah. here that you flipped right. out to yeah. the side. And that was a really popular engine. Yes. But I don't think anybody really did it as well as... The series they came out with in 52, 54, right. these killer, these were yeah. just so much further ahead of yeah. everybody else. Right. It was just, 
It was in the small motor category. There was nothing so, to be said. So let's talk about the championship oh, here, good right? Oh, Lord. That's, My God. They had different designs, right? They had that yes. hydro drive. Yes, they did. That The hydro drive is down here. Yeah, we can talk about that for a second. The hydro drive uh, right here, the champion hydro drive, seven and a half horsepower, had a clutch dog in it like a full gear shift. All it only engaged forward and neutral. It would disengage, but it also had on the back side of the handle, in forward gear, you could run this thing hydraulically it would turn the propeller. It actually had the propeller shaft was a, uh, a hydraulically driven pump. Hmm. It had the, and you could control the amount of oil flow to it by this little sector in here. So that would have been like a variable speed. Yes, and you could rev the engine. The whole idea was you could have the engine turning up so it didn't quit on you, yeah. and you could barely move. Yeah. Uh, there's a video of that on uh, YouTube, now, Pine Champion, Tree Boating Club. But Champion also had a uh, full gear shift as well, right? Did yeah, they? Yes, they had another engine. They had this Champion Suite 16, yeah. which has spring drives in the lower unit, forward, right. neutral, and reverse. Okay. All packed into that tiny little lower unit, okay. which is very fast. Yeah. But it's, uh, well, to say the least, it works very uh, abruptly and uh -huh. uh, not smoothly, uh -huh. and the company went out of business with that engine. So, mm. and then Mercury had their spring drive, which yeah, came along a little bit, so I think about the same later, transmission. automatic transmission. Yeah. Yeah, did that yes. work well for them? That, that worked okay, but it also, when you wanted to run a, Skier, should we turn it off and go out and look at that engine too? I've got one of those. Hmm. In the late 50s, Mercury had to compete a little delayed with Johnson's QD series, which had a neutral spring drive. In other words, they disengaged the spring, it would go into neutral. That one way that flip one we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, Mercury's answer was because we had a close association with, with Chrysler. They had push button gears. You push this in to be forward, you push this one in for neutral. All right? And you could only push it in at a low speed. It had an interlock in there. So this had the spring drive for forward and neutral. And uh, it worked okay. It had a wire that came up, but they, they were marginal, uh, a marginal engine. But they had pretty colors and they had push buttons, so they sold. Then Mercury came out with, in 57, they came out with the Mark 10, which had full spring drive, very much like the Champion Sweet 16, except that being in the lower unit of the Champion, Mercury had it up here in the leg. And they put the water pump on top of the spring, so the water pump is up in here. So it had to draw water up to it and as a result the water pump failure was fairly high and it's very difficult to change so even though the engine ran well the fishermen loved it it was expensive to work on it took it took somebody really who knew what the heck they were doing in order to fix these and they had a weakness they came out with a 20 horsepower and then a 20 yeah i think a 20 horsepower version of this and the ball bearing at the top of the springs was a flat axial bearing and it couldn't handle loads, uh, vertical loads, it could only handle sideways loads and they failed when you use them for water skiing and stuff like that. They wear out and then allow the springs to, to slip between the two drums and it made a very expensive mess to, to fix if you could at all. A lot of times you had to replace the whole leg section and so forth. So it was a Successful design, uh, the angle design they kept. You can see it on some of the later engines here. This little 9.9, .9, this is a full gear shift version. It also has an angle drive. And um, that part they kept. So it wasn't a total waste. And that's it. Okay, 
All the shiftable lower units operate in the same manner. Okay, this would be forward, excuse me, neutral, and we're in neutral now. If you hold on to that propeller, I'm rotating it, it's not moving. So these two gears, which are moving by the pinion gear, are not engaged to the drive shaft, to the prop shaft. In forward, you just saw this move. It's now engaged to the forward gear, so I can't hold that. It's moving that in rotating that propeller in that direction. And when we shift it into reverse, you have to, the engine should be running, and that's why, because they get caught on top. Now it's running in the opposite direction. I'm still rotating the shaft in the same direction. And that's how all of these fully shiftable lower units run. Some of them have different mechanisms for moving this clutch dog. Some of them have different mechanisms here for moving the clutch dog. Uh, but they all operate in the same manner. There's a clutch dog going between the gears.